Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here every year talking about uh, stuff related to cholesterol and risk. Uh, obviously, it's always good to catch up with a lot of old friends here as well. I trained here, this is, I think, going on to 11th year since I graduated from THI. So a proud THI graduate, always glad to be here and catch up with old friends and uh, talk about a few things. So what, what I have been given as, as, the, as a topic for discussion today is to talk a little bit about personalizing risk assessment for patients when we see them in our office. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. This is based on the 2018 cholesterol guidelines. As some of you would know, these guidelines came out in November of 2018, like any other guideline effort, this was a major, major effort. So I'd like to just thank all the uh, members who are listed here, our two uh, chairs who've been really uh, the grandpas of cholesterol management, uh, doing it for 30, 40 years and part of all the guidelines. So I have no relevant disclosures related to this slide. Just a few comments on what this guideline entailed before we get into risk assessment. Uh, this guideline writing committee basically included members from about 11 organizations that you will see here uh, listed at the top. So a lot of organizations, uh, including both physicians, nurse practitioners, and our physician assistant colleagues. It is, it is in chunk format, so it's much easier to read, but despite that, it has 121 pages, but it is divided up into sections now. Any of you who has not seen this, I would highly recommend you go and look at it because it's much easier to read. It's not one of those long guidelines. You're only allowed about 100 to 200 recommendation supportive text for each recommendation. So you read a recommendation and the guideline writer has to make sure that, you know, in those 100, 200 words, they explain you the rationale for that guideline. So it's called a modular chunk format of the guideline. That's happened now for the last year or so. So they're easier to read. You'll see that there are 29 class one recommendations, 26 class two A, which means something that can be done, 2B, which is something that may be done, about 14, and class three, something that should not be done. And then there are two value-based recommendations based on cost and benefit. So what I want to achieve in the next 25 to 30 minutes is discuss the rationale for recommendations for the treatment of three primary prevention groups. Again, remember, this guideline talks about four major groups. One group is patients that you and I take care of a lot, which is patients with established cardiovascular disease, those who've already had a heart attack or a stroke, those who've had a peripheral arterial disease that's symptomatic. That's not the group we're talking about. They have declared themselves. We don't calculate risk in those. That's a secondary prevention population. I'm happy to talk about it because I was intricately involved in that section of the guideline, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about prevention of first cardiovascular event. And when we talk about that, there are three patient populations that you really need to know about. One is patients with high LDL cholesterol. And what I mean by that is LDL cholesterol levels 190. Uh, the second group is patients with diabetes who have not had an event yet. And then if you don't fall into any of these two categories, then we talk about pure primary prevention patients, a patient who's 55 years old, who comes to your office, who just has hypertension, or maybe has nothing and wants to talk to you about their cardiovascular risk. So those are the three primary prevention uh, populations that I'll talk about. And again, this is the mantra that we use. How and why we estimate risk. First, we estimate the risk. Again, as I'm not using the word calculating because it's not that precise. Then when we estimate the risk, how do you personalize that risk to your patient? Because, you know, these calculations and risk equations are great, but how do you personalize it to the patient that you're seeing in your office? And then the last is, how do we reclassify it? Because nothing is perfect in the world. So how do we make it as much precise? And I think this is where these guidelines are, are an enhancement over the last set of guidelines from 2013. I think the 2013 did very well in terms of estimation of risk, and these guidelines talk more about personalization and reclassification, and that's what I would like to tell you. Okay, so this is really the slide that summarizes everything that you need to know about 
primary prevention as far as cholesterol is concerned. Now I'll go through this slide and each of the you know, big boxes you have there. So try to remember as much as you can. I don't expect that you will remember everything. This is all available uh, publicly. So you can pretty much download and just put this wherever you're practicing. But I'm going to give you some rationale for each of the recommendations. Things that are in green are class one recommendations. Something that should be done, as I said, 2A are those that you, you can do. And again, 2B would be something that may be done. So let's start out with the first group. That's the group of LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 190. Remember the mean levels of LDL cholesterol in US population right now are about 120 milligrams per deciliter with very, very small standard deviations. When you go above 160 of LDL cholesterol, you're already in the top 20, 30% of the population. Above 190, you're in the top 5% of the population whether you have familial hypercholesterolemia or not. And I wanted to show you this because we all miss this. You know, a lot of times you get these patients with first MI and their LDL cholesterol is 195. In the chart, people write high LDL cholesterol, but it never occurs to them that a lot of those patients may actually have familial hypercholesterolemia or a genetic cause of their elevated LDL cholesterol. I put this slide up, which is difficult to follow, but I'll summarize it for you. What they've done is they've taken patients with LDL cholesterol of 190 to 220, and they have compared them to those whose LDL cholesterol levels are less than 130, which is the average for our US population. Whether they have FH or not, look at what is your risk of having a heart, heart disease related event. Five times higher risk, even if you don't have FH. If you have FH, that risk goes up to 17. What that's telling you is that if you have FH, then you had a lifelong elevation of LDL cholesterol, so the risk is definitely high compared to someone who does not have FH. But despite that, the risk is extremely high. When was the last time you saw an odds ratio of 17 for an event? Or for that matter, five. Generally, we're dealing with odds ratios of 1.5 or two. So remember, be very careful when you see these high LDL cholesterol levels. Don't just write high LDL. Think of FH because FH is an autosomal dominant disorder. The whole family needs to be screened. It's a genetic disorder. 50% chance of a person giving it to their kids. So just remember that do not do any risk calculation in a patient who has LDL cholesterol levels above 190. That's the biggest mistake you can do. Go ahead and treat them because their lifetime risk is very high. This is the other thing that I would like to mention. This is again, a more recent study that came out that that tells you that when you look at patients above LDL cholesterol of 190, again, you don't have to have FH. If you look at their event rates in, in men, look what, you, what happens here. If you are 40 to 49 and your LDL cholesterol levels are above 190, your event rate is comparable to someone who may be 60 to 69 years old, but has LDL cholesterol levels less than 130. So what you're doing is, that CHD is accelerated by 10 to 20 years by having high levels of LDL cholesterol. If you look at men, uh, women, it's accelerated almost 20 to 30 years in terms of the risk of events. So it's not trivial. Don't forget about this group. And then we know, this is data from 4S study, that when you give statins to these patients, statins work. So the question is, what should we do? Well, this is what we know. If you have homozygous FH, they get their first event, you know, in the second decade of life. If you have heterozygous FH, which is what you and I see and frequently miss in their 40s, early 40s, mid 50s, having an event, these are the patients. But if you give them statin therapy early on, you can pretty much bend the curve and bring it closer to an average person. So start early, start aggressively. So that was our first group. The second group that we have in the guideline is the group of patients with diabetes. And I put this slide from the CTT meta-analysis. There's one for blood pressure, there's one for cholesterol. Obviously these are the most, I would say close to the truth kind of analyses because these are patient level meta-analyses of multiple RCTs. And what you will see here is that per millimole, about 39 milligrams per deciliter reduction in LDL cholesterol you get about 21% reduction in major vascular events. Whether you look at diabetics or non-diabetics, it's the same. 
but that's not the point. The point is this. If the relative risk reduction is the same, despite that, if you look at the absolute event rates, diabetics have much higher event rates compared to non-diabetics. So if you take the same relative risk, but your absolute risk is high, you're going to gain more benefit. If your 10-year event rate is 10% and I say I'm gonna lower it by 10%, that's 1% absolute risk reduction. But if your baseline risk is 20% and I say that I'm going to lower it by 10%, now I'm lowering your absolute event rate by 2%. So remember in diabetics, for the same relative risk reduction, we're getting more absolute reduction in events. And that is why we treat diabetics so aggressively, even when they don't have established cardiovascular disease. The other thing that this guideline talks about is risk enhancers for patients with diabetes. And they all make intuitive sense. You and I take care of patients and we all know that these things matter. Long duration of diabetes, having albuminuria, having nephropathy, retinopathy, if you have subclinical PAD by having ABI, if you've measured it, you don't have to, but if you have, those are the things that make diabetic patients even higher risk. What the guidelines are saying is that you should use modern intensity statin therapy in all patients with diabetes, but if they have these risk enhancers, then think about using high intensity statin therapy because they are the highest of the high risk. Okay, so we've talked about two groups up till now. LDL cholesterol above 190 without history of cardiovascular disease, patients with diabetes. So those were the two primary prevention groups. And then we get into the big bucket of primary prevention, which is patients who don't have any of this and they just walk to your office. It's a man or a woman in their 40s or 50s says, well, what can I do to reduce my risk of having a cardiovascular event? And there, the most important thing is to assess risk. If we don't know what is this person's 10 year risk of having a heart attack or a stroke or dying from one, we will never know what to do. And I'll give you some examples here why it is so important not to use intuition, but actually calculate 10 year risk. We talked some of this, you know, in the, in the blood pressure uh, uh, talk as well, but this is what we know. If you have a patient that you lower LDL cholesterol, let's say by two millimoles, right? If you have that patient's risk, five-year risk of major vascular events of less than 5%, you're going to prevent 10 events. But as your risk goes up, look how many events you will prevent. 10 versus 120. It's an order of magnitude higher. The same holds true for blood pressure as well. If you lower systolic blood pressure by, you know, 12 millimeters of mercury, in a patient whose major vascular event risk is less than 5%, you're going to prevent 14 events versus much higher, much, much higher if your five-year risk is much higher. So everything depends on the absolute risk, not relative risk. And that is why it is important for patients to know, what is my 10-year risk of having a cardiovascular event? If they know that, they will understand the number and we know that half of the patients that you and I prescribe cholesterol lowering medications or antihypertensives, especially in primary prevention, are not taking it. Your or my assessment whether my patients are taking it is a, you know, coin toss. I mean, it's 50% chance that you and I are wrong. So again, if they know their numbers, it's better that they will actually do it. So it's a class one recommendation to be doing a 10 year risk assessment in patients. There's no harm calculating a number doesn't harm anyone. On the other hand, it has shown that if we do that, it actually improves initiation and intensification of blood pressure and cholesterol lowering medications, as well as 10 year risk at follow up goes down because people are taking their medications, they probably are making some lifestyle changes as well, which are extremely, extremely important. So this concept of risk assessment is not only limited to cholesterol guidelines. I think Dr. Taylor will talk about it, but because of SPRINT now we know, and, and by other trials and from CTT meta-analysis of blood pressure, even in blood pressure, as I showed you, the benefit you get from a therapy is dependent on your absolute risk. So even blood pressure guidelines are now are recommending using pool cohort risk equation for risk calculation to actually identify what your treatment goal is for blood pressure lowering.
So now here is where we are. We talked about these two groups. We said if you don't fall into these two groups, then you do a 10-year risk calculation if you're between the age 40 to 75, and then you get a number. All of this is publicly available using pool cohort risk equation. What you do is you get a 10-year be less than 5%, 5% to 7.5%, which we're calling borderline, 7.5 to 10%, 20%, which is intermediate, and more than 20%, which is high risk. Now, what do you do? a hundred thousand healthcare providers nurses doctors physician assistants and if you do a pool cohort risk equation i am pretty sure it will overestimate risk because it's not picking up a lot of risk that is there because of you know lower risk that's there because of high ses or a patient that's very engaged on the other hand if you did the same thing and took a lot of hiv patients pool cohort risk equation will underestimate the risk. The reason being that they have a lot of other things that lead to cardiovascular disease. HIV itself could do it, psoriasis could do it. At the same time, we know that low SES or socioeconomic status itself is associated with poor cardiovascular outcomes. So you have to know when you do this that just this number is not enough. And that is why clinician-patient discussion and further calibration of risk is extremely important. We should not stop at calculation of 10-year risk, but go beyond that. And that is where these kinds of lines go. So that's one concept. The other aspect of this is, I put down the three major primary prevention studies here. I don't think you should even try to read this. I just want you to focus on this part. If you calculated a 10-year ACVD risk in the placebo arm of those studies, you will see that patients who were even five to 7.5% 10-year risk derived benefit. We know that even if you have 2% or 3% risk, 10-year risk, you will derive benefit from statin therapy. The question is, how many patients will you need to treat to actually get a meaningful benefit, right? But 7.5% is a very good threshold whereby patients seem to start deriving benefit. And I'll say even 5%, you have a clinical trial-based evidence, FCAPs, TEXCAPs, or, and MEGA, where you could actually start therapies much, much, much sooner. So now this is where we are. You have seen a patient, you calculate the 10-year risk. If the risk is less than 5%, they are at very low risk of having a cardiovascular event, just do lifestyle modification, which is extremely important, and reassess the risk in five years. Don't stop. Risk assessment is a continuum. It should not happen once and then never. So if the risk was less than 5%, well, talk to the patient, then go ahead and do lifestyle modification. If the risk is more than 20% for 10 years to have a heart attack or stroke or dying from one, well, they're very high risk. So go ahead and do lifestyle and drug therapy, which we know is statin therapy here, preferably a high intensity statin therapy. They have much higher risk of event, right? So these two, I think it's fairly simple what we need to do. What do you do with this borderline and intermediate groups? That is where I think a lot of calibration needs to happen. And this is where we say that you have assessed the risk. Now you need to personalize the risk. Does the patient have a few things in their history whereby they might be at higher risk of cardiovascular event, which will prompt you to discuss with the patient that maybe taking therapy now is better for you? And what would those things be? And this is where these guidelines are an enhancement. We're talking about a concept of risk enhancers. This is how you refine risk at an individual patient level. When you do a 10-year risk, and you can do it, you can Google it now, pool cohort equation or ACCHA risk calculator, you will see that family history is not a variable. If you saw a patient that's 52 years old, comes to your office and says, my dad had his first MI at the age of 54, their 10-year risk is 8%. Should you start them on therapy or not? Well, it's a risk enhancer. It should prompt you that maybe I should and continue with the lifestyle. What happens if you actually have a patient with metabolic syndrome? Well, it should prompt you to maybe start therapy early. What do you do when you have primary hypercholesterolemia when you haven't crossed the 190 threshold, but you're between 160 to 190? We know that at 20 years follow-up, 
they have a higher risk of CHD and mortality from CHD. So maybe treat them early. Patients with chronic kidney disease, we know they're high risk. How about chronic inflammatory diseases, psoriasis, HIV, lupus? For the first time, we're talking about women. History of premature menopause or history of pregnancy-associated conditions, preeclampsia, pregnancy-induced diabetes. For the first time, we are saying that when you're assessing risk of a woman to have a heart attack or stroke, ask about their menstrual history. Ask about their gestational history. And that is the reason, because we know those women have higher risk of events. So if you see somebody age of, at the age of 55, their 10-year risk is 8%, but they had pregnancy-induced hypertension, guess what you should do? Probably start therapy early on. And then some of the other biomarkers, if you want to use. And I wanted to just bring your attention to that. This is the first time that the guidelines are actually picking that up. And then there are some ethnicity-associated factors. For example, South Asians, we know, get MI at a very, very you know, early age. And it's very aggressive disease. So that's also there in these risk enhancers. So you calculate the risk, bring the risk enhancers into the equation. So this is how you would do it. You do a 10-year risk. Okay, There's a decision point. Decision for no drug therapy, or even if you meet 7.5% and you have brought risk enhancers into the equation, and if the patient is comfortable, you're comfortable, go ahead and start decision. I mean, you made a decision, start therapy. You don't have to do anything else. But after that, if there is any uncertainty on your part or the part of the patient, then use a calcium score for further risk stratification. So it's a three-step process. As I said, assess risk, personalize risk, make a decision whether you want to treat or not. Still uncertainty, reclassify using an imaging study. So don't do a calcium score on everyone. And we know now that calcium score is very powerful. And if the calcium score is zero, well, maybe you can withhold therapy for at least five to 10 years and reassess if you're calcium score is high, above 100 or above 75th percentile, treat. We know those patients have very high risk of events. And then if it is between 1 to 99 or less than 75th percentile, generally most would say that go ahead and treat, especially if you're above the age of 55. Okay, but this is a gray area. So that's how we do it, the whole risk assessment and personalization. And this is what the calcium data is. Again, if we say that 7.5% is the treatment threshold where we seem to think that you derive a lot of benefit from statin therapy. This is what happened in Mesa study. What they did was they did calcium scores and followed these patients. This is at the follow-up of 10 years. If your calcium score was zero, even when you had 10-year risk that was about 7.5%, look, it provided you a good test which could be used as a decision support that the 10-year event rates were below 7.5% if your calcium score was zero. So you could potentially withhold therapy with some caveats. Don't do it on everyone, only when it's uncertain, okay? And we can talk, it, talk about it as a question. And that is why calcium score is there in the guidelines. But remember, if you're above 20% risk, even if your calcium score is zero, your 10-year risk is still 11%, the observed risk. So you should treat. So don't do calcium score in patients who are very high risk, is what I'm trying to tell you here. On the other hand, if your calcium score was, you know, 1 to 100, which is that mid category, you can see it's all over the place, right? It's indeterminate. Some of them are above 7.5%. Some of them are just reaching 7.5%. Some of them are not. So what I would suggest to you is use your clinical judgment. Always err on the side of treating patients early because we know that even at 5% risk, they will derive a benefit. And when it's above 100 we know that everybody, almost everybody derives a benefit, okay? And again, you're not gonna do it in this category, but you're gonna do it in 7.5 to 20% and maybe some who are between five to 7.5% 10 year risk. So this is how we are. I mean, low risk, right? Low risk, lifestyle modification. If you are high risk, lifestyle modification and medication therapy. If you're in this borderline risk, do a discussion, look at risk enhancers, you're still uncertain, the patient does not want to take statin therapy for their entire life, do a calcium score, and then decide where you fall. So again, estimate, personalize, reclassify. Okay, those are the three steps. So again, we talked about this group, the patients with diabetes as well as high LDL cholesterol. We talked about this group, 
If you don't fall into any of those two categories, you do a 10-year cardiovascular risk assessment. If the patient is low risk, just lifestyle modification. If you're high risk, go ahead and do lifestyle modification, but also treat, don't do anything further. If you're not in those categories and you're in this borderline to intermediate risk, do some risk discussion, look at risk enhancers. If you have those enhancers, treat. Even before enhancers, if you have 7.5%, you and patient are comfortable, go ahead and treat. You are going to be right. Only when there is uncertainty, look at risk enhancers. If there is further uncertainty on your part or the part of the patient, then go ahead and do a calcium score. These are the risk enhancers that we talked about. But then if you're still uncertain, go ahead and do a calcium score to give you an answer. Use it as a decision support, not as a screening test, is what I would tell you. Don't do it on everyone that's intermediate risk. Now, I haven't talked about this group, but this group is extremely important as well. These guidelines actually talk about from the age of zero up to the 39 years of age. Again, these are the groups where you want to pick up FH, kids who have family history of cardiovascular disease or a parent with FH. And again, 20 to 39 years, you're going to estimate lifetime risk. We don't do a 10-year risk because these equations we only do in patients 40 to 75 years of age. But I just want you to remember that that part is also there. So again, take home messages, emphasize a heart healthy lifestyle in everyone, whether it's less than 5%, more than 20%. That's the key, that's number one. But then treat patients with LDL cholesterol above 190 and those with diabetes early and aggressively. If you don't fall into those two categories, then assess or estimate ACVD risk when you're 20 to 39 years, it's a lifetime risk. It's not a 10-year risk. 40 to 75 years old, it's 10-year ACVD risk. If you're 40 to 75 year old, you have diabetes, use a moderate intensity statin therapy, high intensity if you have some of those risk enhancers in diabetes. If you don't have diabetes, your 10-year risk you've done and your intermediate risk, well, you can start therapy right away based on multiple randomized controlled trials. If you still want to, then do the risk discussion, bring risk enhancers into the equation. If there's still uncertainty, you can use a calcium score to be used as a decision support, not as a screening test. So again, there was a lot of information I gave you. I expect that if you can just remember that flow diagram we had, which is directly from the guideline, I think it will help you a lot. And again, if there are any questions later on, then I'll, I'll take those as well. Thanks for your time.